Thank you very much. What's important is that there's some applause at the end. You know, if, if anything I've said is worthwhile. Uh, I appreciate the, the, the long introduction. Two things to take from that. One, it was obvious I never could really hold a job anywhere. Uh, and second, when people ask me, uh, gee, you know, you were in government and then in banking and then you decided to go into academia. Uh, why? Why did you make this change? And I said, well, it's, it's pretty easy. Uh, after you've been in government in Louisiana and then in banking in Louisiana, it's pretty much a choice between academia or the Federal Witness Protection Program. Uh, either way, you're generally never heard from again. Uh, I did, though, I guess went on to, in, in mortgage banking and that, into an area that uh, I was heard from again, doing a lot of uh, TV and speeches around the country and in various parts of the world. Uh, I had the opportunity to testify um, I guess two weeks ago now, City Planning Commission uh, on this issue, very brief, uh, verbal, I submitted some, some written comments, and I was admonished after the fact that perhaps some of the terms I use were a little too technical, uh, economic terms, for those, and they said, Jay, you know, try and tone it down. So for tonight, I thought what I would do is to say I'm gonna cover this in some local terms. I'll be talking about uh, putting this, soft shell crab po boys, Beer, coffee, beer, coffee, sort of repeat. Uh, Walter White in Breaking Bad, if any of you ever saw that show. Uh, mosquitoes, uh, an alcoholic architect, not mine currently, but a, a previous one, uh, and a city councilman indicted for bribery. Certainly not the gentleman sitting here. Uh, we're talking uh, well over 100 years ago. Now, why am I here? Well, according to uh, somebody posted something on one of these pro Airbnb posts, uh, I'm paid by the hotel lobby. When my wife heard that, she said, okay, where are the checks? You, what have you been holding out on me? Uh, not only am I not being paid by anybody, but it shows kind of the imbalance uh, in the monetary resources. The short-term rental committee group, uh, a number of whom are sitting here in the audience, <laughs> can attest to the fact that if we have a meeting at a coffee shop someplace, we're passing the hat to pay for the room rental in the back, oh, whatever, 20 bucks or whatever it is. So, you know, we, we really don't have any money behind this effort uh, based upon what we're facing with the, uh, the corporate power of Expedia and, uh, and Airbnb. Uh, I've been told I have a long history of being a corporate hitman, that I'm out here just to uh, working on behalf of corporations to attack this. I'm not even too sure what that is. I've worked for one corporation for a while, which is Fannie Mae, and then spent years and years after that trying to put them out of business because I disagreed with what they were doing. So I guess in a sense, I'm a hitman against the corporation, but I don't know what that means. I have zero credibility on any issue involving local economics. Uh, people that have worked with me know my very, very sorry record in terms of being able to predict Federal Reserve interest rate moves over the years. So they would say, look, he doesn't know anything about national economics either. So uh, maybe they're right on that point. Uh, how did I get involved? Well, I was at a neighborhood meeting, the Mid-City Neighborhood Organization, not too long after we moved here. And we had some presentation by the, uh, the short-term rental group, pros and cons. Meg was the one who showed up uh, to kind of talk about some of the issues. So I really had no idea what was going on. And I listened to this and I said, what? What are these people talking about in terms of the arguments on the pro side? Uh, one of the ones I really like and keeps coming up is that you know, it, this keeps money in the hands of local residents. In other words, we're not sending off money to these big bad corporations that own hotels we keep the money right here in the city. Well, if, if you actually look at the numbers as to who owns a lot of the whole house short-term rentals and the multiple owners and who's actually uh, domiciled anywhere in Louisiana or close by, uh, it's not borne out. But if you think about the miracle that has taken place in this city with the redevelopment of a lot of sort of class B and C office buildings that were never gonna be filled with offices, but have been converted to hotel use, that have been converted to apartment use, condo use. It is a miracle that any other city in this country would die to have. 
I mean, when you drive through some of the areas in, in other towns, that still is this ghost land of old downtown buildings with no hope of what they're going to do with them. But when we're seeing the redevelopment taking place, I've got a friend who says he considers it a sign of the apocalypse now that the Ralt Center is being converted to a hotel. <laughs> now, what happens with the idea of the new investment dollars if you sort of take this attitude of, okay, after you come in and have all these nice construction jobs and a big benefit and the type of investment any other city would love to have, but oh, by the way, we're gonna change the rules and suddenly dump in 5,000, 10,000 additional units in competition versus the studies that you did as to whether or not uh, that's a viable investment. Think of the new, uh, what is it, the Catahoula Hotel on Union Street, how that's been converted. Explicitly designed, when I see their advertising, aimed at the younger millennial visitor, new experience, but that then is direct competition with the new sort of sharing economy, with the, uh, the short-term rentals and that sort of thing. I gotta say, it years in, um, uh, that I spent dealing with commercial real estate and that sort of thing. Knowing what's going on now, someone had come to me for a plan for something like the Catahoula, there's no way I would have financed it because I said, look at what your competition is, the market is, show me the numbers that are actually gonna show up. I guess it's actually better than a W place. I stopped staying there, I kept tripping over boxes of rocks and things like that in the dark, never could see, so <laughs> stuck to others. Um, the other one is, you know, it brings people here who would otherwise not come. So there was a study by UNO that said, we did a study and there are X thousand people that stay in these Airbnbs and they spend this amount of money and this is their contribution to the economy. Uh, that's fine as a survey that's not an economic analysis for decision making purposes. It's the difference between static and dynamic analysis. Let me explain to you what static versus dynamic analysis is. Soft shell crab po' boy. I walk into Johnny's over in St. Louis this time of year and I got soft shell crab po' boys, at least a little sign out on the cabinet. And I say, you know, I'd like a soft shell crab po' boy. And I say, well, I... With the reasoning that was put forward on the, the short-term rentals, I would then turn around, walk out, not only not eat anything there, but not eat anything anyplace else. So because that was not available, I would not spend my dollars at all. Life's not like that, it's dynamic. You make choices based on what you face at the time. If a certain thing is not here, then you look at something else. What happens if the soft shell crab boy, po' boy's not available? What's the first words out of my mouth? Do you have oysters? <laughs> you know, that is a dynamic decision. That's what takes place in rooming. If it's available at a price, people take, avail take advantage of it. If it's not available, they'll make other decisions. So that whole vein of analysis is simply wrong. Now there may be at the margin a small number of visitors who will come only because there's a price point that is so low, because the overhead expense is so low and that investment cost is so low that they'll stay there that maybe they would not come. But I would argue that's a very sliver of percentage and it's certainly not worth the cost of what then comes about um, because of the whole system. Uh, property taxes keep going up and people need this money to pay those taxes. I am gonna lay out why it is that short-term rentals have been driving up property taxes. If you look at the valuations, if you look at the prices at which properties have been trading, for the income value on that, that is what the assessor is using then to set the comps for everyone else's. So in a sense, it's coffee and beer, coffee and beer. I don't know how many have been to Seattle. Seattle for years had the highest per capita consumption of coffee and the highest per capita consumption of beer. They were related. Because when you got up in the morning, most of the time in Seattle, it's dreary, it's foggy, you need a cup of coffee to wake up. You need another cup of coffee to stay awake. So Starbucks and Seattle's Best, all these other coffee brands, you know, came from there. It is no accident because they drank a tremendous amount of coffee to stay awake through the dreary days of the upper Northwest. But what happens then in the evening? You got all this caffeine and you gotta start drinking beer to sort of come off the caffeine. So you drank all this beer to put you to sleep. What happened the next morning? Not only was it 
dreary, but you were hungover. So then you needed a coffee to keep going. So you had one thing feeding on another. Well, it's the same thing as we're looking at with the property taxes. Yes, maybe you need the income from the short-term rental to pay the property tax, but at the same time, it is the existence of these short-term rentals that in many cases is driving up those property taxes by artificially driving up values on an unsustainable basis if you look at the growth in incomes and the growth in uh, employment in the city. Other argument is something along the line is I lost my job. Um, I now make a living buying up houses and renting them. They never say illegally, but renting them is short-term rentals. But I think the illegal point is important here. This is sort of the Walter White argument from Breaking Bad. You know, what did he do when he found out he was, you know, had cancer or whatever, he was gonna die in two years? Well, he became a major drug dealer. Um, well, you know, let's be thankful these people haven't all gone into the meth business. You know, they're only dealing with, but the, the, the point is this, you know, I would like to sell beer off my front porch. I can make money on it. I don't particularly need the money, but you know, it would be great to be able to use your house for whatever purpose you would like to use it, particularly if you ran into some sort of trouble, but there are limitations, there are laws to be followed. That is not an excuse for breaking the law just because something is going wrong in your life at the moment. Over the years, I dealt with a number of people who uh, were in trouble with their houses, no longer had the income because they lost their jobs. My advice always was go ahead and get out from under the house. It is not that important to try and go through extraordinary measures to turn things around just for that location. Start your life over if, if you lost your job, if the industry shut down or something else. Uh, don't go to these lengths. And, and so all of these stories about how this is what's keeping me in the house, you, you can't pick some illegal activity then to keep you in the house. Uh, there was a poll of uptown restaurant owners, as I remember from this presentation, again, it was well over a year ago at the Mid-City meeting that said they liked having tourists stay close to their restaurants. My immediate reaction was, well, who the hell said no? I mean, you know, if it wasn't 100%, I would like to know, you know, who said no, because either they live on top of their restaurants and no one around, or they didn't understand the question or whatever. That should have been 100%, absolutely. We want people to stay close to our restaurants. In the, um, I don't remember. I, you know, sort of didn't have it in front of it, but I do remember that that was one of the polls that was put up. Um, <coughs> Finally, and I, I see this a lot on some of the neighborhood blogs where they say, look, it's my house and I can do whatever I want with it. Uh, you know, that, that is really an uninformed argument, to put it politely. That if you look at the purpose of zoning laws, why are they there? Real estate investment is a long-term investment. You're buying a house for some number of years, and you know that there are things that can go wrong. You can lose your job, uh, something bad can go wrong with the economy, uh, all sorts of things that could potentially go wrong with that investment with your mortgage. But one of the things you would like protection from is what could happen to you next door. What's to keep someone from opening up a bar? What's to keep someone from opening up a dry cleaning establishment or massage parlor or who knows what? So that early on, to give some protection to people to be willing to make these long-term investments in houses, in neighborhoods, in communities, zoning laws were created. Because commercial use always has a higher value than residential consumption use. Eh, always, okay, there's maybe some small percentage, but by and large, if you can generate cash from a property, that property's gonna have a higher value than if you're just living in it, either as a renter or as an owner for consumption. Supreme Court, this goes back to 1926, validated the, the zoning laws and they've never been successfully challenged. I mean, it is a fact of life that the rules are there, uh, they've been set by the, the governing authorities. The key though is that zoning laws are only as good as the enforcement behind them. If you don't enforce What's the use of having them on the books? 
and the decision process I'm talking about as to what gets enforced and what doesn't get enforced fundamentally destroys the trust in the city, uh, trust of the citizens of their city government. Because absent that trust, then you start looking at um, less of a willingness to make local investment. So how do the SDRs then damage homeowners? I'm not going to talk about the noise and the nuisance and the this and the that. I'm just going to try and deal with some of the economics here, some of the finance, a little bit different take than what you've heard maybe in other meetings. But certainly we're seeing the result of increased property taxes. Uh, nuisance impact on the potential sales of your house and to an informed buyer who when you do try and sell, uh, what happens if you have got a, a problem, a short-term rental nearby. And then the real important impact that I think has been completely overlooked is the risk of injecting, the risk of tourism dollars directly into the heart of neighborhoods. So I'll talk about these three uh, individually. So let me give you an example. If you bear with me for a little bit of mathematics here. Uh, I made up an example here. Uh, the numbers really aren't available, but they're within the bounds of reasonableness based on what I've been able to discern, read, or, or capture from other newspaper reports, that sort of thing. So let's say we have a house that would sell for 350000 based upon someone living there. The consumption value of the house, that's what my job currently will pay me enough money to support uh, the, the mortgage on that house, the payment on that house, is strictly residential use. But perhaps I can make 3000 a month as a short-term rental. Kind of in the range of some of the numbers that have been thrown about. If you look, some considerably higher, some lower than that. So just picking a number, 36000 So the annual return on the investment, if you bought that house, and it, we're able to make 36,000, a little over 10%. Not a bad return in today's market. Now what happens? If instead you decided to invest in a property that was similar to a, uh, uh, a short-term rental, short-term uh, lodging, the current cap rate, return rate on that, it's about 7%. So it's kind of like the break-even rate. That's a point at which you'd say, okay, I've got other investments perhaps that make sense. And again, it's a rough number. You can pick 8%, you can pick 5%, depending on what the return is uh, on alternative investments. But here's the issue. If you then say that 7% is the number at which, you know, I would no longer do it, I will pay up to $514,000 for that same property to get my break-even return of 7% holding the rental the same. So what do we have now? We have a group of people looking to buy a house to live in it who generally are willing to pay upwards of 350000 but a group then that wants to rent it as a short-term rental is willing to pay considerably more. Anecdotally, because I don't have the addresses, I don't have the information of what houses are actually being used as short-term rentals, all I know is when I hear back from realtors and others about the number of transactions in the Marini and everything else, the number that take place solely for short-term rental purposes, the sales that are taking place in mid-city, what happens then is prices are bid up based upon the commercial cash flows. Not based on that, because if you think about what's going on, we've had a 2% increase in employment over the last year in the city, 2% increase in jobs. Very little increase in income. The growth in incomes is not there to support what's going on in home prices. That's a bad sign. I mean, I've seen it in California, I've seen it in Florida, I've seen it in other places where essentially there was speculative value by investors buying it based on what the money they thought they could make out of those properties and ultimately what then happened to those markets. Now, the STRs properties go up because again, the value is based upon the cash flows they generate. Prices have been going up faster than local incomes. This is absolutely great news if you want to sell. 
I talk to people, I say, you know, this is going to drive up your property taxes price of your house. They say, well, isn't that great? The value of my house is going up. I said, when are you going to move? Well, I'm not moving anytime soon. Well, what happens? You get to pay property taxes on that amount until then. If you're the mayor or anyone else, this is great news because you get the additional income as property taxes go up and you get to blame it on the assessor. Well, I talked to the assessor and I said, you know, is there any way you can sort of back out these transactions when you do your comps? Because if, you, if you're looking at comparable sales, can we back out the sales that are taking place for commercial purposes as opposed to the sales that are taking place for residential? And he said, no, because I don't have that information. Nobody can give me the information on which addresses are being used like this for commercial purposes. And as long as the city still has its zone residential, I've got a classified zone residential, I'm dumping everything to the pot. So everybody's property taxes are going up based upon the transactions that are taking place as driven by the STRs. Realty track. Uh, are, are a company that takes a look at what's going on in, in, in real estate across the country. New Orleans is, I think, the highest city in terms of home flipping right now. If you look at the short period between buying and selling, buying and selling, we're at the top of the list. Partly driven by what's going on with this and the bidding up of this is just going right into the assessor's books. Now, so I, I said, you know, the, the, the funny thing is, I guess, is, you know, not only you get to live next to fraternity parties every weekend, you get to pay for the privilege in the form of somewhat higher property taxes. Excuse, 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 so, excuse me. How do fraternity parties come into play in terms of people, tourists, doing short-term, that are the customers with short-term rent? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused here about tourists and fraternities. Well, okay. why don't we leave that to the end? People can talk about yeah, the fraternities. Please explain so, so the uh, now the other issue, and perhaps along with this, is that if a short-term rental is nearby, there is either an existing or a potential nuisance that will impact the sales value of your house. So that under the original proposal that was sort of pushed by the mayor's office with these uh, limitations and the location of the whole home rentals, the one per block face, and et cetera, everything that was in it, if the license were already taken, you could only get that value if you were selling as a short-term rental. But if you weren't selling as a short-term rental because that was already taken for that block, you're paying the higher property taxes, You've got the nuisance value where someone else coming in saying, well, I want to live there, but I don't particularly want to live there uh, with all that going on. So I'm going to cut the price 10, 20, $30,000 below what maybe would perceive just based on the average market. So I think for this reason, any density limit that is discussed in a short term uh, rental regulation is meaningless. It's going to go away because there is going to be tremendous pressure to say, well, you know, this is taking place. I'm not able to sell my house at this point. I would like them to sell it at this. Okay, fine. You know, we'll give you an exception. We'll give you an exception. And that's then going to uh, uh, be the rule. Now, let's talk about tourism, which I think <coughs> really is what concerns me more than, than anything else in this. Tourism is separate from convention business, okay? Just sort of keep that in mind, that very discretionary in terms of the visitors that come here, they're not coming here specifically for a convention, uh, so that whether they come here or somewhere else is, is you know, really kind of a, a decision, could be a last minute decision on their part. But tourism really is only one of the legs that support the housing market. These numbers are from the end of 2015, so a little bit dated, but not by much. Really, employment hasn't changed much. You may not be able to read them in the back, but if you take all the jobs associated with food and services, almost 38,000, or about 19% of total employment in the city, in Orleans Parish, is uh, accommodation and food services. So again, some portion of that's convention, some portion I'd separate out as, as discretionary tourists, arts and entertainment, if you wanted to throw that in, another 3%. So you're probably looking at 23% of the jobs in the city are tied to the convention, 
entertainment, tourist business. The rest of the housing market in the city is supported by healthcare, social assistance, education, professional technical, retail and wholesale is about 10%, finance and insurance, construction 3%, all other, I added that up to about 28%. So over three quarters of the housing market in the city is supported by something other than tourism. Now, here's the issue. We all know what's taking place in places like Houston, places like Homa, Thibodeau, Lafayette, somewhat here, North Shore, with a decline in the oil and gas industry. As you pull those jobs out, there's pressure on the home values. What we're talking about here, though, is we're going to take and uniquely inject the risk of the cash flows just associated with tourism into the heart of all the historic neighborhoods in the city. Here's my point. If tourists are coming in and, and they're providing the cash to support the values of these houses and that, what happens if something uh, impacts tourism. Well, I've got one example for you. Here's a story from Friday. Miami. Zika virus sparks concern among Florida tourism officials. For the first time since it was founded in 1946, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention issued a warning to Americans this week not to travel to a neighborhood in the United States. First time since 1946. And you can't see it down here, but then the director said the advisory could last for a full year. Now, what happens to those discretionary tourist dollars spending if we have that? What happens if something then interrupts uh, uh, tourism travel? Uh, uh, a, a, you know, a terrorist attack on a plane? What if we had something like Nice, God forbid, happen uh, down at the, at the river. All sorts of things then could drive that away. Suddenly the, the, the cash values that are going in as people either borrowed or invested from wherever they are. Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Turkey, uh, New York, any other locations where people have bought numerous houses for the cash flows associated with this and they lose their cash flows because of a fall off in tourism and they start selling. What happens then to the elevated values in these neighborhoods that were driven up by, by the, uh, the short-term rentals. So that's the mosquito argument on this. Uh, now, th the point is, you know, what happens when they dump it? We have seen that happen. 2008, 2009, markets dominated by investors. When the cash flows were turned off, the investors fled, they dumped their properties, and it took years for the Florida market to recover, it took years for the Vegas market and some others then to recover. That's the kind of risk I think that we're needlessly injecting into the residential system here. Frankly, you know, it's gonna impact the hotels. I don't wanna say I don't care about the hotels, but they're all big guys and women. I mean, they got capital, they got contingency plans, they got backup with other conventions coming in. They can take care of themselves. I'm more worried about what happens uh, in the neighborhoods to the neighborhood values if something were to cut off the tourism dollars. So, where do things stand? Well, uh, the City Planning Commission voted against the whole house residentials in residential neighborhoods, but as I understand it wants to allow owner-occupied throughout the city and I guess home, whole house rentals in commercial and mixed use zones uh, there is an impact there, of course, in, uh, in a number of ways. Again, it's the uncertainty of how this will be put together as to how that impacts any future investment in hotel properties, particularly boutique type hotel properties in the city. Or anybody that wants to open a B&B, &B, licensed B&B &B certainly uh, is going to uh, think two or three times about doing that. So the city council now will be taking it up. Uh, I actually don't know what the schedule is but they'll be facing considerable political and financial pressures. If you think about it, this is coming up the same time the city budget's being put together. Now, what happens, you know, for this project or that, and the mayor comes back and says, you know, I just really don't have the money for it, but 
you know, if we could do something on these short-term rentals and start getting some fees coming in on this, uh, I think there'll be um, uh, considerable pressure on the council then to make some sort of uh, accommodation on this. But keep in mind, uh, Airbnb wins if nothing happens. Status quo is just great. You know, there's no loss right now, a little bit of bad publicity, that sort of thing. But if there's a deadlock, uh, absent any sort of enforcement coming out of uh, uh, city administration, uh, nothing happens. So really, fundamental issue here is trust, I think. You know, as I thought about this issue, how it's affected, in a sense, my personal life, decision to come back here, uh, w what I do that, you know, even if we win this particular fight, what could happen six months from now? Is there really the level of trust that ultimately who's going to be in the city administration, are they going to take the same approach as, as the, the current mayor in essentially being completely hands off for enforcement? Uh, again, lack of enforcement is the same as, as, as saying everything is fine. Um, and it, it, it struck me that cause I live in a house that is subject to the HDLC requirements. And so, and, and as well as in mid city, so it determines how thick the fence posts can be and colors and whether or not, you know, I gotta go through permits to kind of make a wall from here to here to get a little extra space and, you know, so, which is fine, I can live with that. But the attention that's paid to structures as opposed to the attention that's paid to the viability of neighborhoods just sort of strikes me as a little incongruous. Um, so, you know, the, here's where I'm sort of coming from on this. And I know this is going to be a little different than some of the people in this room, but if the mayor's office and others believe that long term, the best value for the assets of this city really are turning, whether it's the French Quarter or the Garden District or, or parts of Mid-City, into essentially a place for tourists and devoid of local residents. Let's have that debate. Let's talk about how that's accomplished. Let's talk about, does this make sense? Is it really then in the best interest of the city? I don't think so, but at least let's have that open debate. Let's not have a situation where it's purely because of the absence of enforcement, that becomes a fait accompli. That becomes the new reality, just because of an absence of enforcement. And you know, it shouldn't be, we've got to have the debate as to where things go. If you've got a law in the books, let's talk about, you know, do we really want that to continue? Do we want people to live in historic neighborhoods or do we want to use that as some sort of mega you know, Disneyland, what's the name for Paris? You know, now it's Disneyland for grownups. Uh, <laughs> go there is, is the, uh, in some cases, a few residents are, are left in certain areas. Um, but again, it, it shouldn't be done with this um, uh, sort of uh, just complete absence of enforcement than defining what happens. Let me take a little bit of a personal twist here and, and talk about how uh, I'm impacted on my, my sort of personal landmark. Uh, this is a house that uh, I own on Canal Street. Some of you may remember it from, from years past or go, going past it. Uh, designed by an architect, uh, H. Jordan McKenzie. Uh, it's an interesting conglomeration of architectural styles. So the front of it, with sort of these crushed columns and the, the leaves and the vines are from sort of turn of the century, Austrian secessionist movement, uh, the Jugendstil, the Art Nouveau, the, the, the new style. So the, the idea of the architect was to have these flowered columns going up, but appear to be crushed then by the weight of the house coming down on them. But as soon as you go through the front door, then it kind of looks like a Viennese coffee shop or beer thing. And then as you go beyond the next door, it's pure prairie craftsman, kind of looks like Frank Lloyd Wright in the decor. And, it's, and it's, you kind of say, well, what the hell? You know, but it was, so, so we, my wife disavows any sort of <laughs> participation. She kind of went along with it. But I said, look, you know, we've, 
got the time now, retiring, put some money into it, I kind of know what I'm doing, I hired a good architect and, and, and start going through it. So that's my own personal kind of Louisiana landmark. It's on the city's list of historic landmarks and that, so uh, we have to have everything um, uh, checked. Also, the house was known for years because of the Christmas lights that the Centani family would put up. Uh, so it was always known as the Centani house, but of course, it wasn't built by them. Uh, it was built by a fellow named William J. Kane, who was a notorious head of the Boodle Council, the, the corrupt city council of, uh, I guess, the late 1880s, early uh, 1890s. Kane was indicted twice for bribery. He was known as Boss Kane. Uh, he was acquitted twice based on a hung jury. They, they stopped trying to convict him. This is from the New York Times, December 22nd. Uh, as the case was getting ready to go to trial, he essentially took $1,000 and he to a French company say, look, I'll give me the money and I'll pay off whoever in the city council needs to be paid off to approve some wharf that they needed. And the New York Times said, all attempts to shake the testimony of the two gentlemen were unavailing and it's believed that the two councilmen will be convicted. Well, they weren't. It's, you know, and that was the last time the New York Times even came close to having something right, I think. But uh, they, uh, so my point is, here is a house built by a somewhat alcoholic uh, architect who, uh, uh, by a city councilman who had been indicted twice uh, on bribery, who made a lot of money in building fire stations, Old Gentilly Highway, things like that. Uh, third occupant was also indicted. Uh, he was indicted on real estate and securities fraud. So I said, well, given my background in politics and real estate and securities, there's actually good karma in this place, that there were three indictments, but nobody was convicted. Now, the third fellow, Marcel, actually died before he could go to trial, so I guess maybe that doesn't count as much. But, but here's the point. Um, so when we were kind of you know, thinking about where we were going and looking at all this, I actually halted the entire project. Took care of all the structural stuff, took care of the envelope, so the building is kind of protected, but all the work that kind of needed to do in the middle said, let me see, because to me, the, the short-term rental could be an issue particularly for that part of Canal Street. I've got one across the street, I've got one two doors down this way, I got another one a couple of doors back down that way. Uh, and I got to, you know, actually, except for certain periods of time, I don't get a lot of racket. I have more of a problem with the neighbors who like to beep their car horns when they lock their doors at midnight outside the window, but that's a whole nother story. But, you know, I, I do have concern about whether or not the investment I would have to put in that place is protected or whether I think to, yeah, I, I love New Orleans. I grew up here. Some of my high school classmates were kind enough to come sit in the audience. Um, but. I don't want to spend my time having to go down to city council and city planning commission meetings all the time to try and protect this because I know it's, you know, there are other things to do in life. Why, why are we running this risk? Why is there this mentality that we've got to kind of gather citizens together to protect our interests as opposed to the other side being forced to say, uh, this is an excellent idea that we need to, to go forward with. So, you know, it comes down to trust, uh, trust in public officials, to enforce the laws that are on the books because if they're not enforced, they might as well not even be there. Um, and really, people have spent years and decades protecting the history of this city through Landmark Society, through other organizations, preservation resource, and the idea of monetizing that through this method without really, in a sense, addressing the bigger issues long term. A colleague, friend from the Bywater was telling me one day in a, a mood, he said, Jay, what you gotta understand by anything in a city and really the state is that what makes it so entertaining and sad is that we're kind of driven by three words, uh, delusion, confusion, and collusion. Well, I don't think there's any collusion going on here, but I think there's a hell of a lot of delusion and confusion on this issue that we then have to address. So